Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last session of the day. Um, this is Crucial Conversations, uh, 2023 speaker. Um, sorry, reading my own notes. It's Crucial Conversations. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. I'm going to introduce our speakers in the order I think that they'll be presenting. So first up, we have Nicole Sutton. Nicole Sutton is the African-American Special Collections Librarian in the Local History uh, and Genealogy Division at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. She holds bachelor's degrees in marketing and interpersonal communication from the University of Central Oklahoma, a Master of Science in Entrepreneurship from Oklahoma State University, and a Master of Library and in Information Studies from the University of Oklahoma. Nicole has a passion for research, helping others to access information and creating space for people to tell their stories. Outside of the library, Nicole can uh, most often be found playing tabletop games, enjoying the outdoors, or listening to nonfiction audiobooks. Up next, we will have Mandy um, Ultimus Stahl. Yeah. Um, <laughs> archivist Mandy Ultimus Stahl has worked at the Massive Museum for 19 years. A graduate of Kent State University, Stahl has produced uh, documentary works for the museum, such as Maslin and the Great War, Voices from the Archives, the Legacy, of the, the Legacy of Steel, The Greatest Generation, and Faces of Rural America. She was a plenary speaker for the Society of Ohio Archivist 2016 Spring Conference, and in 2015, she appeared on the Travel, Tran Travel Channel show Mysteries at the Museum, retelling the, the tale of Jacob Cox's 1894 protest march. Stahl serves on the Museum, uh, sorry, on the Maslin Historic Preservation Commission, as secretary of the Spring Hill Historic Home and Underground Railroad site, Board of Trustees. Wow, it's a long one. <laughs> and as treasurer and secretary for the Charity School of, of Kendall Foundation. And finally, we have Brad Lepper. Brad Lepper is uh, the senior archaeologist for the Ohio History Connections World Heritage Program. He, he earned his PhD from The Ohio State University and has been spent most of his career working in Ohio. Lepper has published numerous scholarly papers as well as articles intended for a general audience on, a, on various topics related to Ohio archaeology. He's the author of Ohio Archaeology, an illustrated chronicle of Ohio's ancient American Indian cultures, published in 2005 by Orange Fraser Press, Wilmington, Ohio. This book re received the Society for American Archaeology's Public Audience Book Award in 2007. So now I'm going to turn it over to Nicole. Okay, sorry, just getting situated here. Actually, gonna try to hold this and see how this goes. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, as Adam said, my name is Nicole Sutton. I am actually just had a title change about a week ago. I'm actually now the Black Heritage Special Collections Librarian and in local history and genealogy at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. And we are so excited to welcome you to our most recent Crucial Conversations uh, discussion. We've been doing these with the Jedi Committee for uh, SOA uh, since last year. I think January of last year was the first one. And so this is our recent installment. This uh, subtitle is Undertold Stories and Histories, Working with Community Groups and Policymakers to Create Positive Change. Uh, I'm going first, and I'm going to talk to you about our Black Heritage Collection Spotlight Program that we've been doing at the Columbus Metropolitan Library. This also just went through a name change because we changed my title, the collection, and then therefore the program that's about the collection. So it is just changed from the African American Collection Spotlight. Uh, this is way more of my face than anyone has ever needed to see. <laughs> and I thought about editing them out actually and just putting the guests, but that kind of defeats the purpose because the purpose of what we're doing with this program is to create those partnerships and those relationships with the community. So partnership is two people. So I left myself in there. <laughs> but I'll be talking to you about what this program is, um, how we do it, and hopefully from a lens that will get you all thinking about how you could do it at your own institution as well, and um, start doing more community programs if you haven't, or just more on top of what you're already doing. 
So we'll start off by talking about how the program got started. It was actually something that a colleague uh, named Keisha Gibbs, who was in LHG, and before that she was the branch manager for one of our local branches, and she had the idea for Keisha Conversations. And it was a wonderful idea. Unfortunately, um, Keisha's health got to a point that she had to leave the library and then uh, passed away a couple of years ago. And her position was changed into the position that I've now moved into. And I wanted to keep her idea going. So we created it, but we focused it on the collection for the materials that we would be um, using as the spotlight for this, which is the Columbus was African American collection, which is now the Columbus Black Heritage Collection. So we use materials from that collection to have conversations with uh, local community members to talk about aspects of Columbus's Black history. Topics include uh, certain people, so sometimes the topic is just a person in their life and their career, sometimes it's a Black neighborhood in the community, sometimes it's a business, a church, an organization, or in February, instead of focusing on a single person or organization, I try to make sure that it's a resource that everyone can use to learn about Black history. Um, so these are shorter programs. They're not short form, uh, which I looked up the definition for, and that's like 30 seconds or less now. That's what short form is now, folks. <laughs> um, but they are 15 minutes about on average. Um, so they are shorter programs, and we do them at lunchtime, so that hopefully people can watch them on their break uh, while they're having lunch, something like that. And they're done in an interview format, so I will uh, ask questions of the guests and they will respond. Uh, and it's usually one guest, but we have done a couple recently that were two guests. It's uh, been a parent and a child on those, and they've worked really well. They are a little bit longer for those, like 20, 25 minutes, but we're still keeping them under 30 minutes. And I think that's part of the success with these is that they're small, they're manageable, so we get a pretty good crowd for each of them. Um, they are virtual programs. Can I get a show of hands? Who is doing uh, only virtual programs at your institution? Anyone? Who, who is doing uh, all in-person programs? Show of hands. Who's doing a mix of both? Almost everyone, cool. <laughs> we are doing a similar thing at the Columbus Metropolitan Library, but this is one of the programs that we are keeping virtual um, so that more people can see it and again, enjoy it hopefully on a lunch break. They don't have to travel to a library, uh, to the main library downtown or to a branch to try to enjoy those. Uh, they are uh, go live at noon, like I said, around lunchtime, and there's a recording available immediately after because we do these on the Crowdcast platform. Um, so immediately after the program's over, it'll buffer for just a few seconds, and then a recording is available so that anyone can watch it if they miss it when it is live. Uh, we do have a PowerPoint as the visual aid for each of the programs, but it's almost entirely images. So again, it's focused on the images from our digital collection uh, that are sometimes just digitized materials from our archive, or sometimes they are just loan materials, but focusing on uh, showing people more of our collection and kind of giving the stories behind those materials. There is no viewer or audience Q&A. Uh, we actually closed the, the Q&A box on uh, Crowdcast and just had a chat. So sometimes we'll, we'll reference the chat and say, oh, someone said this. And sometimes there's just nothing added that really adds to the conversation. So we don't even mention the chat, but it gives people a way to kind of interact as well. And then the guests usually participate at a library location. Quite frankly, because most of our guests are older and don't feel as comfortable with using the technology and getting themselves signed on on their own. So they come to the library. We do most of that work for them. But if someone does feel very comfortable with the technology, they can do it remotely. Because again, it's a virtual program. So next, we're going to kind of go into the logistics of the program. Again, hopefully you're, you're kind of thinking about, oh, how, how can I tweak this and make this work at my institution? So in the planning phases, um, I start brainstorming topics. And sometimes that's thinking of who I know who could talk on a subject. Sometimes I jump straight to the second step, which is checking our existing materials in our archive and our dig digital collections and seeing what we have a lot of. Can I find someone who can talk on this subject and go from there? And then uh, we start contacting potential guests. And I want to see a show of hands who has done cold calling for any of their jobs. All right, who loves cold calling? <laughs> okay, 
Yes, you raise your hand. More power to you. Uh, I don't. <laughs> um, so I created a, a script for myself so that I kind of have like those main points that I want to convey to someone who might be considering being a guest with us so that they know uh, what they're they're signing up for. So uh, I have, again, been more successful with calls, hence, hence the icon, because uh, again, most of the guests are older, so emails haven't... Uh, emails go unread or they just don't have an email address. I've had to send a letter or two, um, but mostly calls have been the most successful way to reach out to those guests. I provide an overview, give them a list of some of the past guests that we've had on the show, and then uh, explain their time commitment and their expectations, and then confirm a date with them. Then from there, uh, we go ahead and line up about four months in advance uh, for the library, like plan four months out, uh, but usually have those done about two months before the first one of those four would start. So like on March 1st, we'll have May, June, July, and August all set up. That's mostly to get our marketing printed in time. So that's, again, that's our internal process. You can do it at your own pace. Another planning tool that I use is I keep a spreadsheet of all of the, the ones that we have coming up for the year. I have a tab for each of the years that I've been doing it. And then I keep a list of running ideas so that I can pull from in that brainstorming phase. So anytime I have a colleague who is say, uh, oh, I think this would be a really great topic for you, I'll add it to the ideas list so I can come back to it later. And then uh, I usually hold a preparation meeting with the, the guests. And in that's usually about a 45 minute to hour long meeting. We start off by doing introductions. It's usually uh, myself, the guest, and another staff member who uh, is kind of a support staff, staff member on the program. So in that they, they'll kind of help with the, the technology. And so it's good to have them attend the meeting if they can, just so we can do introductions then. I familiarize the guests with Crowdcast, with the platform that we'll be using for the program so they understand what uh, we'll be using. If we're doing it virtually, I'll go ahead and take them into the green room and go live so they see what that looks like and they know how all of that works so they can get more comfortable with it. And I make sure they have an account, uh, have them add a profile picture, and <laughs> help them with all of that technical stuff. And then we discuss the topics that correspond and the corresponding images that we might use for the program. So this is actually what takes the bulk of the time because basically I'm having them tell me their story and what they want to talk about during the program so that I can kind of um, develop the questions that I will then ask during the program as we're going along. Then I'll confirm the location. Are they coming out to main library? Am I meeting them at a branch? Is that more convenient for them to record the program? And then technology, are you using our tech? Are you bringing your own laptop? Are you doing it from home? And if you are doing it from home and we're doing this uh, as a virtual practice, are you using the same computer, camera, and mic that you plan to use for the program? <laughs> because we want to test that. Um, so just kind of confirming those details. I'll request a brief file from them. And uh, when I say brief, I try to tell them stay under like 75 words because we have 15 minutes and I don't wanna spend uh, five of that <laughs> just reading your bio. So just keeping that very brief. And a lot of times people will have a longer bio, they'll send me a longer bio and I just get permission to kind of dwindle that down a little bit so we can be very focused. And then, I complete the digitization, have them complete the digitization intake form so that they're loaning any materials for, to us to digitize, to use for the program, or just to have in the collection because they're like, oh, I think you would uh, enjoy having this. I'll have them do that at that point so that we can then digitize in the next step. So that program preparation part, uh, again, we'll digitize those materials, upload them to the collection, or as you saw on that last slide, we have a My Upload tool at Columbus Metropolitan Library. So if they are tech savvy enough, they can upload some images to us. We can go ahead and add those to the collection and get those included in the program as well. I conduct any follow-up research. So in them telling me their story, if they've got um, anything that they want to uh, me to look up, look into, there's an address for this business that they used to have, what's that address? It's usually not a very heavy load as far as what I'm doing as far as follow-up research. Then I'll gather the images and create the PowerPoint. Again, that PowerPoint doesn't have hardly any text. The text is usually only citations or just identifying what an image is for the audience. 
it's almost entirely pictures from the collection. So it's not time intensive to do that PowerPoint. And then I write introduction and conclusion text, which includes their bios. So that they kind of know what I'm going to say at the beginning, where they're going to have to start answering questions and all of that information, and then how I'll close out. And then I check those interview questions that I was kind of developing during the prep meeting, but like actually writing them out and then send all of that to the guests so they can look over everything and be prepared. Because the last thing we ever want is to surprise anyone. We are working with these community partners. They are gracious enough to share their time with us. I want them to have an enjoyable experience that is not a lot of work for them. And then on the day of the program, I really just wanted to kind of go through what I use and what you need for that. So we use both a meeting room and either a study room or an office for that. So we set the guest and the support staff member up in that meeting room uh, where they will have uh, two computers, one for the, the support staff member to kind of be the administrator of the virtual program. And then we have a, a laptop for the guest as their, their mic and their camera for the program. And then I'm set up in either, depending on if we're at a branch or at the main library, if we're at a branch, I'm in a study room. <laughs> and then if I'm at the, the main library, I'll be in, actually in my manager, Angela O'Neill's office. Many of you know Angela. And I'll just be in her office recording from there, which is what you see on the bottom. And up at the top is what uh, it looks like in one of the meeting rooms all set up. Uh, as I said, we will have usually three computers for the program, my computer, uh, and then the computer for uh, the speaker and for uh, the support staff member. And again, that support staff member, they're there to start and end the program. They're there to provide uh, tech support to the guests and insert links and interact with the chat. And overall, on the day of the program, you really only need about an hour's worth of time. So we ask the guests to show up 30 minutes early so that we can set up all of the tech and do some audio and visual checks. Uh, we spend about 15 to 20 minutes recording the program. Like I said, we try to keep them short. And then you have about 15 to 10 minutes afterward to then just wrap up. And in that wrap up, uh, we are returning any loan materials to uh, the guests after we have digitized them, used them in the program, we're ready to give them back to them. Uh, we have a parking garage at the main library, so I'll usually validate their parking because again, thank you for coming. We want to show you uh, that we really appreciate you and don't want this to be any more work or money for you. Um, record attendance stats. So that's like right after the program. And then after I've uh, had a second to breathe and uh, regain my senses from a very rushed morning uh, doing the program, I record the attendance statistics in Communico. I send a handwritten thank you card to the guests. Again, this is by no means a requirement, but again, just really showing that appreciation for their partnership. Uh, share the recording internal with the library. So we have an uh, internal called MyCML and we can put posts. So I'll post it up there so that our 800 employees can see uh, what we're doing in local history and genealogy and hopefully watch the program. And then I will also upload the recording to our digital collection, My History. We use uh, Content DM for that. So you can see that's what it looks like after I've uploaded it to the digital collection. And then after that, um, you just want to make sure that you are promoting it. So we do have a marketing department at our library, so they have their own marketing that we, they do, but we also have an email that we do every month. So in that monthly email, I also have a Black Heritage Collection Spotlight where I do a little write-up and then relate it to the program so that I can say, also, we did this program and you should check it out. <laughs> and then the last thing is just maintaining those relationships. So you see this picture up here is from the November uh, was African American Collection Spotlight at that time, where we had the president of the Tuskegee Airmen uh, local chapter, the Ohio Memorial chapter. And since then, he received an award, it's Gregory Edmonds, if he's specifically, and he received an award for his volunteer work at the National Veterans Museum and Memorial, and we went to support him. Uh, so I attended and, and showed him that support. I've also been to the Tuskegee Airmen Day in March. So again, just showing that support for your guests and keeping those re relationships going. All right, I'm going to try wrapping up here really soon. So just to kind of talk to you about where I see this uh, program going and how it's going to evolve over time. One, it becomes easier to find guests and topics. Your colleagues are going to know what you're doing. 
because you're going to keep bugging them and telling them, hey, watch my program. Um, and so they will refer people to you. Your guests will give you referrals. They'll say, well, you should really talk to this person too. And um, it'll just get easier over time as you start building those relationships. We've actually talked about starting to do panel discussions with multiple past guests that um, have similar topics, so they might be able to collaborate with each other and have a, a bigger, longer program based on that. And then we also see this as a way to connect to our oral histories initiatives. So we've been making a bigger effort to get more uh, oral history, especially since we've been using our phones to record them uh, recently at Columbus Metropolitan Library. So uh, we actually see this as a way, maybe even during that prep meeting, to create an oral history with their stories. Or uh, with our most recent program that I did on Tuesday, we were talking about the dollar house lottery in Columbus that you should take place in the 70s and the 80s and early 90s, I believe. And we actually asked anyone who had won a dollar house to please reach out to us. And we had someone in the chat actually say, I won a dollar house and still live in it. So we're going to be reaching out to them to see if they'd like to do a oral history with us. All right, and then some of the challenges that you might face in doing this. Give me a sec. So some of those challenges are just developing those relationships in the beginning. I came from a very privileged place where, again, Keisha Gibbs had been in the community for a very long time and had built many of those um, relationships, as has Angela O'Neill and Erin O'Donovan, who are both um, supervisors in local history and genealogy. So I wasn't coming in starting from scratch, but people didn't know me, so I did have to create those relationships. Um, and Again, to reiterate what Mackenzie said at our keynote uh, this morning, show up, show up for people, be in the community, be interactive, um, so that the time when you have to ask them, hey, can you do this program with me, is not the first time they're seeing or hearing from you. This is something that our CEO, Patrick Lazinski, says all the time, show up for your community. So like Mackenzie said, if you are a leader and you are able to give your staff the time to go out there and be in the community, it's very important for building these relationships. And then building trust with marginalized communities. You're going to have to build trust so that they trust you enough to loan materials to you, to uh, represent people as whole, complex individuals and not just for their contributions to um, the society and the community. So it's it's going to be a thing where if they're going to have reservations and you're going to have to work through that. Um, and again, that starts with building those relationships and being there for them. Uh, in advance, but it's also just going to be conversations and working through that together. You might have to navigate uh, family dynamics. <laughs> a lot of times we have the children of people who we're discussing and, and their contributions, and you're going to have uh, many children who have many different ways that they would like to see their parents represented. So uh, you might have to deal with some of that as well. And again, that's a lot of conversation. And then convincing people that their story is worth telling. We have so many people who are like, no, you don't want to hear about me. I'm not, we're not a part of history. It's like, yes, you are. Everything you've done and contributed makes Columbus and Central Ohio uh, what it is. And it's so important. And we've heard from everyone in the American 250 presentation. You are a part of Ohio's history. You are a part of Columbus's history. And what you have done and what you have contributed and who you are matters. And then, of course, the positive outcomes far outweigh those challenges. Um, you're acquiring new materials for the collection, potentially, because a lot of your guests will bring in materials um, they want included in the presentation. So you're getting new materials. You're sharing the materials that are already in your collection more widely. Do people know that you have these materials right now? This is a great promotional uh, tool is to get that out there to the community as well. And then you're building those relationships in the community so you can have more of these programs so that you can do more, you can be bigger, you can do longer programs and, and really uh, work with the people who you're serving. And then of course, the very last one and the most important one, uh, in my opinion, is creating space for people to tell their own stories. Uh, no one can tell the story of your materials better than the people who lived those experiences, than the people who lived through that, the people who lived in those neighborhoods, the people who experienced the racism, the people who went through these challenges. So let them tell their own story every chance that you have. 
Again, I hope this has helped you to think of how you can start having those community conversations uh, with your institutions. If you have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to contact me. I would love to hear them. And that wraps up my time. Thank you. I think so. Technology doesn't. Yeah. Okay. And then go down. Yeah. It gets lost sometimes. Hiding. Oh, It's hiding. So here's right. Sorry, everyone. The technology is hiding. It's it's not <laughs> making itself apparent. That works. Nope. Oh, Uh, yay okay cool you know i feel like three years into this pandemic, like we should be like so much better than this. Like I, I messed it up. It's such a thing. And like, can anyone still not find the unmute button? It's a thing. So we're all in this together. It's all good. So hello, welcome. Um, my name is Mandy. And uh, as uh, was in my biography, I've been at the Maxwell Museum for 19 years. Um, so I started out as a an intern um, and uh, have just been learning about masculine history ever since. Um, and so the, the specific project that I'm gonna share with you today uh, is uh, Missing History of Masculine, Unheard African-American Stories. Uh, so just a, a quick uh, overview of the Masculine Museum. We are celebrating our 90th year this year. Uh, so we started out in this adorable house that was James Duncan, founder of Masculine's House. Uh, so much like a lot of uh, places, uh, cute little, you know, displays in the rooms, woo. Uh, we expanded into uh, a much bigger institution when the library joined us and we expanded the building. And then we moved down the street to this adorable uh, Art Deco um, uh, dry goods store. And we just completed and we're supposed to ribbon cut in March of 2020. Uh, the right hand side that you can see is kind of a newer structure. Uh, obviously, that ribbon cutting was uh, delayed a little bit. Uh, but now we have uh, this beautiful building um, and a lot of wonderful program space, more exhibit space. Uh, our offices were all torn out so that we could display more history and things from the permanent collection. Um, so we're very excited, especially because we have over 150,000 or so objects. Uh, we're going through AAM accreditation and we get to count everything. So I'll tell you, hopefully this time next year, exactly how many things we have in the collection. Uh, so we have everything from 600 blueprints, uh, the Paul Brown uh, football heritage collection within uh, the Paul Brown Museum. We have 90 home movies. We have 2,000 game films from every football practice and game that has ever been played in the in by the Maslin team. Uh, we have paintings. We have rolled textiles. We have all the things. Uh, so there are many, 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 many stories. Uh, that one can tell. We also have a ginormous uh, Russell steam engine from 1916, which we just brought back on site because it's seasonal. So we got to pull that off of a tractor trailer on uh, on Thursday. Uh, and then on the right, that is a jewel automobile from 1907. So not only do we have all this cool stuff, we have two funky cool vehicles as well. So luckily I stick to the paper stuff because um, I don't know how to care for a 1907 car, but I do know how to find a story and care for some paper and photographs. So 
within all of these things, we are displaying all of these wonderful uh, stories, uh, arts, all of the things. Uh, what what kept coming back, uh, you know, during either Black History Month or during a display is, hey, you're sharing the exact same stories of Black Macedonians that you've always shared. And these are pretty much the five people that we had stuck for. These were the main stories that we had. They were very important Macedonians, and we continued to share them. But hey, there's probably some more stories out there that we could tell, right? So how do we even find those stories? Where, where do we go? What do we even have in our own archives? We've never really done a deep dive into the stories that we already had. So how do we do that? So it was brought up during, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, there was a, a Zoom meeting with many important leaders in the community. Uh, it was just after uh, the murder of George Floyd when someone brought up, hey, we should probably do something to, to talk as a community and to come together. And someone literally said, well, thank goodness Massillon isn't racist. We we're like, hold up, wait, well, hold on. We, did we forget some, some stories that were in there? It was like, well, we haven't even captured those stories. We haven't even told those stories. So how do we get those stories uh, out? How do we tell them? How do we talk about what we have been through even just in the recent past? Uh, and how do we get to a, you know, a better place as a community? So we gathered together uh, a big committee of Maslin staff members, uh, Maslin Museum uh, board members, community members, uh, so that we could all have this conversation together. So as storytellers and museum people who are in the business of you know, displaying and collecting, how do we tell that story? Uh, and what from the community are we missing? Because uh, obviously I, you know, we're, we're not out there every day living that experience. So uh, we're going to need to, to hear what we're missing. So the whole point and purpose was to start gathering and seeing uh, you know, what our community was lacking. So thank goodness, uh, Marva Dodson, a wonderful community member, uh, a nurse for many years, uh, was just named a distinguished citizen of uh, Maslin Washington High School. For many decades, she had been uh, gathering and preserving a lot of those uh, Black Macedonian stories. And she did a fantastic job being able to take this presentation out to the community, displaying it in libraries, uh, at festivals, um, and sharing all of those. She has, you can see, she's got display boards and she's got everyone kind of broken down into categories. So important, uh, important people in medicine, teachers, churches, uh, all of those things. And she amassed a, a very, very large collection. So she has a lot of that collection. So what is what is left? What is left to gather? Did she get everything? Is there is there something that we're all missing? So obviously we have to start with our own stuff. So we were so worried that you know those five main people that we kept telling the story of. You know what if that those are the only things we have? Um, and when we were talking about you know putting an exhibit together of this, you know like oh my gosh, can you even fill the wall space? Like oh no. I was like, hold on, just it's going to take some time, but we can totally find some amazing stories in the archives. So I'm happy to say that there were many, many, many things already in our archive and many things out in the community that we were able to, to gather, to scan, to preserve, to share. So I started with the oldest photographs in our collection. Um, our glass plate negatives are absolutely just one of the most glorious uh, displays uh, ever of, of Macedonians doing whatever it was that they were doing. Uh, there are Black musicians. Uh, we have an amber type from approximately 1855, 1860. Um, sadly, none of the people on this page have names, but this is like my, my goal in life is to give them their names back because there are no identifications written on here. Um, so I have some ideas, but um, haven't confirmed them all yet. Another one of the amazing glass plate negatives that we had was uh, a cornerstone laying for a church. Uh, and so I posted this to Facebook and I said, please help me identify what is happening here. So we identified it as Shiloh Baptist Church, cornerstone laying in 1917. And literally two weeks ago, I found the image on the right, uh, which was an up close of the, the choir for Shiloh Baptist, which took their own photo in addition to the, the kind of, you know, big giant group photo. Um, so, you know, starting to gather those, those faces, uh, the people, the places uh, all together. And then I dug even further. So, um, excuse me, not only were there are so many beautiful visual uh, pieces to be able to show, uh, you know, life in Massillon, but there are newspaper articles. Um, there are a lot of scrapbooks that people have put together that happen to have 
uh, very important topics covered. Um, you know, do we rename the the park uh, after uh, you know, one of the first black men who served in city council uh, as the president? Um, Shiloh Baptist Church, there were documents that were sent to the mayor of Massillon, and we have the, the mayor's archives. Um, so we can document different uh, events that were happening at that at that church, uh, who was uh, you know, the minister at the time. And on the left-hand side, these are two of my favorite documents in the archives. Um, they were, uh, there was a lawyer who had donated his archive to the museum, and these were in the 1830s legal papers. Uh, these are two manumission papers uh, for, for two uh, African Americans who uh, came from West Virginia and supposedly, we're still tracking it down, settled uh, in Massillon and were farmers. Uh, but these were actual papers uh, that gave them their freedom. Um, and what an important thing to, uh, to hold on to, but we still don't know quite where, uh, where those people are. So these are, there's obviously ongoing research forever and ever, amen. Um, so someday we'll have all of the answers, right? That's our goal. So there were yearbooks, there were yearbook photographs. Um, again, because we have such a massive football collection and so many amazing things, we have uh, a document of every single player that's come through Massillon who went on to play beyond Massillon. So many, many athletes uh, documented there. Uh, we also have a nursing collection, um, uh, the Massillon School of Nursing, uh, and so many photographs um, of some early students uh, attending there. And also, uh, a lot of people got their start in band. Um, so we have uh, there on the left, that's Lori Lightfoot, the uh, mayor of Chicago, playing the trumpet. In the middle, that is Reverend James Lawson, um, who is playing the tuba uh, who went on to be a very important part of the civil rights movement. Um, so he was in band in Massillon, um, which is fantastic. Again, so all of these things, uh, there were police scrapbooks, obviously, uh, there's some arrest records. We tried not to focus too much on any kind of negative uh, documentation, because what's the point? There's no point in that. Uh, but on the left, there is a, a one of, I think, the third Black police officer. Uh, we had the first Black Miss Massalonian covered in the uh, school newspaper. Uh, in 1904, we had uh, a very specific school uh, built for Black students. Um, so there was a, a large uh, you know, ribbon cutting for that. Uh, Mary Church Terrell came to speak. Um, and that gentleman there uh, with the, the nice ribbon, uh, he's actually we're working on getting him a, an Ohio history plaque um, for the cemetery because he's never had a headstone even though he's buried in our cemetery. So, um, so that's something that we're working on. And so then uh, in order to figure out what organizations uh, were within Massillon that needed documented, uh, we realized, um, you know, the, the Urban League, there was no file for the Urban League. There was like one tiny program thrown in there. So once I figured out that they were funded uh, in their earliest days by the United Way, uh, which was the community chest, I went back into all of those scrapbooks and found just the most wonderful information. Uh, it gave budgets, it gave who was serving in the Urban League, what programs they were doing. Uh, there were photographs of kids on the playground. There were uh, prominent doctors who were serving on the fundraising committee. Thank you. Uh, and of course, as we're going through this whole program, uh, you know, sadly, some people passed away. Um, some people who were on my list of important uh, individuals to talk to. Uh, but we also had celebratory moments. We had uh, the, the third Black Miss Massalonian was named. Um, down here, uh, this is actually uh, on Monday, uh, the Robert A. Pinn uh, Armory in Stowe was rededicated, who was, uh, Robert Pinn was a uh, Black soldier from Massillon who won the Medal of Honor. Um, and his family came up from Virginia to attend that ceremony. So I got to speak to uh, some descendants of someone who was very important um, and meet with them and record their stories as well. So when looking at uh, the community, I, I think the, the other uh, component is trust. Um, you know, this has not been a place that people have thought to maybe bring their history. So to establish the trust that we're not going to take and misuse uh, any history that's brought to us. Um, so we had a Black History Archives Day where people could come with their things. We would scan them while you wait and then hand them back 
uh, you would kind of sign off that, that we can use those digital images on our websites, um, but you get to take those things home with you. We're not, we're not going to take them unless you want to donate them. And so these are a couple of the things that were brought forth um, and pictures that we uh, were able to take during the event. So important obituaries for people that I couldn't find their obituary because they're in a weird time period where nothing's digitized yet. Um, many, many important stories brought forth there. So uh, obviously uh, engaging the media for us in Massillon is very important to get uh, any kind of spotlight on uh, a program. So once it started to appear in the paper, the ball started rolling. Uh, what I think is interesting is that the the, the kind of floodgates of stories and, and things didn't really come until after uh, the exhibit actually came down. Um, and now on Facebook, we're really engaging, you know, 7,000 people at a time. So there were video interview components too. Uh, we identified kind of the top 10 people that we absolutely had to interview in the community. Um, including Beverly Smith, who's uh, the 26th president and CEO of uh, the Delta Sorority. Uh, she's from Maslin, Ohio. Uh, Reverend James Lawson, again, uh, he was uh, he agreed to uh, interview with me via Zoom, uh, which was fantastic. Um, yeah, various amazing community members who came forward and agreed to interview with us. So all of these are available on our uh, website, missinghistoryofmaslin.org. And um, there are 34 hours of audio and video that we took as a part of this project. Um, there are 156 clipping and subject files that didn't exist before. Um, that's all the, the names that we've added. We took 4,000 scans from the, uh, the items brought forth during Archives Day um, and uh, you know everything ever since that's been emailed. So real quick, let's see. Um, so as we kind of looked at what we're going to include, we knew we had to at least cover um, some of uh, the, those uh, you know, tougher stories, some good, wonderful celebratory ones, but again, we can't gloss over the, the bad. Um, so we did, we did ask uh, various members of the committee what uh, they believed we should include, um, and we did include um, you know, some di discrimination. There were some protest marches of the 1960s that we included. Um, and some, some publications that specifically outlawed where people could live. Um, so we wanted to include some of those stories, um, but obviously not make it the focus of the exhibit. The focus of the exhibit was celebrating the people of Maslin. We also included some contemporary portraits by Amber N. Ford. It's all in the gallery. Um, one other component was that we made sure that we had a lot of community partnerships and events that people were able to participate in. So, um, you know, board members, uh, community groups, uh, we had a panel discussion uh, about various topics facing Massalonians today. Uh, we documented people who came to the museum for this exhibit. And I'm super, super excited to say that we won the Award of Achievement from the OMA for Best Exhibition of 2022 for budgets over $500,000. So uh, today you can go and watch all, uh, not quite all 34 hours, I'm still editing, but um, there are many, many hours of audio, video, photographs. Um, we're on Instagram, we've got YouTube, and again, Facebook is super engaging, and you can come and see this all online. So thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to let you load that one. <laughs> Like you're doing this. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, for much of my career, I have been a curator of archaeology. I'm now the senior archaeologist for the Ohio History Connections World Heritage Program, but I still identify as a curator. And an archaeology curator isn't that much different than an archivist, except instead of archiving written documents, well, we archive those too. We archive a lot of material culture, artifacts that were excavated from ancient sites. And these really are sort of like documents that allow us to piece together the stories of 
ancient people, people that lived in times before there was recorded history. And so I think there's lots of resemblances here. And in terms of telling undertold stories, stories of, of perhaps underserved communities, I think a common theme of all three of these presentations are gonna be the importance of uh, building relationships and through those relationships, building trust. And basically most of my presentation is gonna be focused on one magic moment that turned into a, 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 an example, I guess, of what can happen if there's that relationship of trust. Um, and I would have other examples if I had them, but I wanna share one at least. Let's see, I have to use this. Right. Okay. <laughs> so as early as 1929, Henry Rowe Cloud with the Winnebago tribe, we now call them the Ojibwe, told the Ohio Archaeological and Historical Society annual meeting, may we not be overlooking some valuable contribution from the lore of our first Americans? And apparently there was polite applause and then everybody forget, totally forgot about it. And, and it wasn't followed up on, which is tragic considering we had this opportunity in 1929. I actually followed up on that belatedly, of course. Um, I compiled a, a paper here in which I looked at every instance of throughout history when some European American early person asked an American Indian about the mountains, like, hey, what are those? And oddly enough, there isn't a lot of good, solid information that I can connect with the archeological record. One of the most common answers, for example, was, well, those were uh, forts built by our ancestors when they were battling supernatural monsters. And obviously that's a folkloristic answer. They were big walls that sometimes were like the walls that surrounded contemporary American Indian villages, which at that time were often fortifications, protection. Um, but I suppose they just assumed that, well, if they're that big, they must be because they were battling a big enemy. So clearly something had happened that disconnected these people from those ancient sites. Of course, there were a variety, an overwhelming variety of things that were affecting that. There was the passage of time, for one thing. How many of you know what your ancestors were doing 2,000 two years ago? Um, there was intertribal warfare. The Iroquois group swept into Ohio and drove out the people living here so they could add Ohio to their hunting territories. Then European diseases, European warfare, forced relocations to places out west, dislocating people from the lands of their inheritance. And, and all of these, and then later, of course, the official Indian Removal Act and that, and that forced relocation and forced re-education. So it, it's, it's tragic to think of all those threads, that cultural fabric that were rent apart. And so it would be fabulous indeed if you could say, excuse me, Mr. Shawnee Indian, what, what, is, what was this mound used for? Of course, they're not gonna know. They're living in Oklahoma. Their lived experience has been in Oklahoma for generations. This connection with the land that was so vital, what was broken. But, through the ceremonial practices and other practices that have been handed down family to family, I think, and I think this demonstration today, this, this brief thing that I'm gonna talk about today, demonstrates that sometimes there is knowledge that can make that connection, that can bridge that gap. People without even knowing that they had knowledge that had been passed down from perhaps 2000 years ago, have it. And if you make the right connections at the right time, if you have that magic moment, you can forge that link. So the Hopewell culture, is the, the artifacts that I'm gonna talk about that we have a new interpretation for now due to this kind of trust relationship that was developed between myself and, and one uh, Shawnee individual. Um, they lived here between one and 400 CE. Um, this is one of their grandest sites. It's the Sipe Earthworks. It's part of Hopewell Culture National Historical Park. And it's one of the sites that's included in our World Heritage nomination. That's site mound, uh, the big one, there are two mounds at site, so it's kind of confusing, but that was completely excavated back in the 1920s by the Ohio History Connection. And in the, what's on the right is a floor plan that they got down to the excavations and where the arrow is pointing is a huge burnt offering 
a mass of, of a shallow pit that was filled with ceremonial regalia and then burned and then buried. And more than 5,000 artifacts were found there, including objects made from copper, mica, marine shell, obsidian, obsidian from Yellowstone Park, by the way, which gives you an understanding of the far-flung interaction that was happening during this period. Henry Shetron was the lead excavator on that. He was uh, in my job back in the 20s, the curator of archeology. span And for him, the most interesting of all the artifacts in that burnt offering were these five marble-sized stone spheres. They have engravings on them that you can see the engravings down there. And he thought they were the most interesting of all the objects, which is pretty remarkable. I wouldn't have classified them as that until more recently. So Chetron, and, and, and I'm gonna be comparing and contrasting sort of stories from an archeologist versus stories derived from indigenous sources and, and how interesting they are. This isn't really fair because this is the 1920s when archeology span was very different. It wasn't as rigorous a science as it is now. And apparently you could just lie about things <laughs> with impunity. So, so Chetron says, these are marbles. And, and their marbles, uh, and they were intended for burial with the remains of a burial 13, which was apparently, Chetron said, a young man. And so he was like the marble champion of the community. And so they buried the marbles with him. Even though Chetron acknowledged that there was no evidence that the game of marbles was ever played in North America before Europeans got here. So all of that's wrong. Burial 13 is not where the marbles were found. Um, and it says in their own field notes that there were no artifacts associated with burial 13. All the marbles are the red X's on that. They're associated with burial 14, but, but they're not associated with it. They're in the burnt offering that's below it. There was a clay floor built on top of the burnt offering, and then these crematory basins were built on top of the floor. So those clay objects, those clay spheres, are not clay spheres, they're steatite, they're stone spheres, weren't associated with any burial. And burial 14 was a cremation with an undetermined age and sex. So no connection to a boy, no connection even to a burial of any kind. And the game of marbles was never played in America. So this is where trust and, and, and happenstance, uh, just you know, chance favors the prepared mind kind of thing. We're going to Oklahoma. I, I've been to Oklahoma now about seven times, different trips. And this has made all the difference. Um, convincing the tribes that you're willing to go to see them, to get their perspective. You're not just bringing them here. I mean, and that really does demonstrate something. And that's uh, Chief Ben Barnes there in the lower right. When I met him, he was the second chief of the Shawnee. Uh, he's now the, the, the senior chief. And this particular meeting was after several other meetings. I, I'm told by Chief Glenna Wallace, who's the current chief of the Eastern Shawnee tribe, that when I when Ben first met me, he wasn't impressed. He, he I mean, after all, you're, we're talking about trying to build relationships of trust with not only people that live in Oklahoma, but that people who have probably serious mistrust of archaeologists who they equate with grave diggers. And I wonder why, you know, when you look at Site Mound, that was full of American Indian ancestors that were excavated. Um, so, but Ben and I gradually developed this relationship of trust. He friended me on Facebook, which I was surprised about, but then I, then I realized he was probably just lurking on my page just to see what I was doing. Um, but later he said that one of the things that developed a relationship of trust was I do a lot of fighting uh, pseudoscience. Like if people are claiming the mounds were built by giants or the lost tribes of Israel, I'm writing columns and saying that that's crap. And that this is the you know the really the, the 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 legacy of ancient American Indians, and Ben respected that. He actually brought that up in a meeting, saying, "I respect that." So then, at one of these meetings, this was probably the third or fourth. It was being held at the Eastern Shawnee Cultural Center, and during lunch break, the curator of their their little museum there was taking me around, showing me the exhibits. And we stopped at this exhibit of the Shawnee drum, and there's a, an example of it. And Ben was walking by. I don't know if he was coming back from the restroom or something, but he stopped and joined in the conversation. And he was telling me that, yeah, when the Shawnee, when, when he makes his ceremonial drum for the ceremonies, the way they attach the hide to the, to the drum is they go to a special place and go get these perfectly spherical black stones. 
and wrap them in the, in the leather and then tie that up. And you can see those little spherical things. And inside each one of those is one of these spherical stones. And they use that to tie the, the drum head onto the drum. And, and I said, it's perfectly spherical. Do you, we found some of those in, in sight mound and, and they're engraved. Do you ever engrave those? And he said, no. He says, no, but how many are there? Are, are there five? <laughs> yeah. And he says, well, five is a small drum, but it has to be for, in their traditions, an odd number for the tying off to work. And from that brief conversation, over the next two years, we started talking and building up the hypothesis that these five stone spheres might be the oldest evidence of a drum in Eastern North America, since all of that was actually burned and the hide and the wooden drum or whatever it was made of that could have burned too. So we prepared a scholarly paper. I actually wrote a paper with a Shawnee chief. Of course, then Ben says, yeah, I actually wrote a paper with an archeologist. <laughs> We, this was the third journal we submitted it to. The others rejected it because they said, well, you haven't actually proved that those were parts of a drum. And I'm like, okay, but we sh they're not marbles. And, and now we have a chance to share an indigenous perspective on these artifacts. How is that not worth publishing? Well, the journal Archaeology, the journal of the World Archaeological Congress thought it, it was indeed worth sharing. And once it was published, we turned it into a, a, an exhibit at the Ohio History Connection. It was a temporary exhibit. And this is where I, you know, how do you, how do I convey to you how to do this? How to do this for your museum? I don't know what, how it happened for my museum. I mean, embrace serendipity. I mean, I'm actually not really sure how this all came together. Louis Pasteur's famous quote, chance favors the prepared mind. It was knowing that those stones were there and being involved in a conversation where that came up. But it's fundamentally all about those relationships and relationships of trust. And that has to come first. Many trips to Oklahoma before this could even begin, before we could even begin a conversation. If I, on my first trip out there, said, hey, Ben, what can you tell me about these things that are found in these mounds 2,000 years ago? He would not have trusted me to share information if he had had it. But I don't think it would have come up at all. Um, and it also has to be working together for a common goal telling the stories of their ancestors and to prove to Ben that, that I was trustworthy enough to, to help him do that. And together we could tell this, this story that I, I think changed a lot about how I do archeology span now, but also how we tell stories about that. And that takes us back to Henry Rowe Cloud. May we not be overlooking some valuable contribution from the lore of our first Americans? Yes, we have been overlooking it, and it's time we did not overlook it anymore. And, and God bless you, and I wish you all the good luck in trying to fill those kinds of gaps, but it's, it's, there's no sort of blueprint for it. Anyway, thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, speakers. Oh, that was very informative. Um, we have technically like two minutes, but we can go yeah. a little bit at the end of the day. Um, any questions? If you don't have time for questions now, you can certainly contact them. We'll give you the contact information out. Their slides online. Um, but yeah, if you have any immediate questions right now before I trip the problems. <laughs> yeah, like all right. My question is for, well, actually, I'll talk to all of you after, but my question is for Brad. Um, I talked to you a little bit at the OMA. Um, we had, um, uh, modeled our exhibit in Clark County after um, what was it, the Ohio History Connection more than 10 years ago. Um, so as we've been watching all of the conversations that have happened with, you know, or that are going on now with talking with um, uh, Native tribes and everything, and I know that there's representation here in Ohio, like Talon um, Silverhorn and other people, but you talk about, you know, going to them um, the resources that are going to be available here in Ohio for people to use are those. Is that uh, is that going to be seen as us making a good enough effort to work with them? I mean, I know we can't all go out to Oklahoma, but like, um, will they be? Are, are they? Is there an effort going to be made for them to put out um, information that we can all access about um, how we might change our interpretation? Um, yeah, I, th I think so. Yeah, we're going to take the, the lessons we've learned and, and share them, obviously. But if you want to 
sort of work with tribal members to develop exhibits or something or put content for your museums, that's going to entail more than just taking our ideas and things that we've shared. It's it's going to be even going up to Oklahoma once it is sort of a demonstration of yes, and it's it's very enlightening. It's tremendous. They have their own museums. Um, I remember the Lion Dot Museum. It was so fascinating, and I wrote a column in the Dispatch about this. The they, they have their exhibits organized in the same way we do by time period, but like so so the Hopewell, the Dean of Hopewell, uh, uh, so on. But they had Wyandotte words for these different time periods. And for me, that was great because not only were they acknowledging that these different time periods that archaeologists recognized were real things, they owned them and gave them their own names. Um, so that was really cool. Any other questions? Um, I was just wondering how, when developing and thinking about what you were putting together, uh, how you dealt with, uh, how you deal with the idea of implicit bias and what you deem to be the most important thing to discuss first in the ter terms of the like Black Heritage Collection. Who you talk to first, who you uh, what uh, you represent first when you uh, discuss certain topics, and then how that then is later, how like now when you begin to say, well, let's make a panel, let's make longer form discussions of these things, how you then look at what you had as an implicit bias to begin with, and then how you fix what it was afterwards if you have implicit bias. Yeah, I mean, what well, one, I believe we all have implicit biases and it's uh, good to be aware of that and try to be conscientious of that. This is actually something I've just recently been working on. I had the opportunity to work with a customer and it's the first time that like, it's just been a customer that we met out on the floor and she had um, some really great material. And um, so it's like, I started to think to myself, it's like, well, does it need to be someone who's a community partner who's already been very active in the community, who we already know from our relationship? And, and no, no, it doesn't. It can be anyone who, again, is a part of Ohio and Columbus's history and their story deserves to be told just as much as anyone else's. Um, so that that is a question that I've actually just now been starting to address, like, literally this week, I think so. <laughs> um, so I'm sure I will continue to get better at that and evaluating that um, moving forward. But if anyone has any suggestions or uh, anything that they use in their work, I would be happy to hear that. But thank you for the question. So I know for us, when we were looking at who, who to interview first, I, I know that age played a, a big role in that, um, you know, specifically the, the the folks who were getting older that we knew, you know, we only have so much time to to interview. Um, obviously, as a white archivist, I've got all kinds of, uh, you know, <laughs> things at play. Um, so I wanted to make sure, yeah, that I was representing the story of, of the Black community in Maslin as, as best I could. Um, so it was asking a lot of questions. Um, and, um, you know, as, as a historian, like I know how to tell a story, but, you know, how do I tell this specific story, you know, without a bias, without an angle, I want to just, you know, here here is the story, you know, with, with not, you know, a whole lot of interpretation, you know, letting the, the visitor who's visiting this exhibit or visiting the archives have their own, um, you know, their own interaction with the artifact or the, the video uh, that, that we posted. We also did just a, a real quick, we did do uh, some content warning or some, some kind of startling parts of the, the archives or the, the interviews that we did post. So, um, you know, the things that, that might spark a, a reaction, we, we gave it a, a content warning. So. I also remember there was another part of your question um, about what parts of the story to tell. And I feel like that's the really great part about how we do the preparation meeting with uh, the, the guests is to kind of ask, what do you want to tell? Like we, Yes, there, there's some of it that is related to the materials because we, we have the images that kind of guide the conversation, but we really want it to be about how you want your story to be told. That That is the main focus. So. Yeah. <laughs> I have a follow online question real quick for you, Nicole. Um, approximately how much of your time and the assistance time per month does this wonderful program take altogether? 
That's a great question, because that's something that I, I like to emphasize as uh, with the program being about an hour, the front meeting being about 45 minutes to an hour, I'd say I don't spend more than about an hour outside of work time. So in a month, three hours worth of time is put towards uh, this monthly program. So I feel like that that's a doable amount, and that's why I wanted to share it with you all. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, we'll have time for one last question. Anyone? Any takers? Okay, um, then let's give our panelists a round of applause. Thank you all. Um, and with that, to conclude the last session, um, Amy, do you want to say any closing words? Can I just say goodbye to everyone? Do we need to? <laughs> I hear about now. So, okay, um, I think with that, we can uh, wrap it up and you guys can mingle and, and work your way out of here. Um, safe travels for everyone outside.